Thank you for having me here again, Jens. Well, talking about the lumbosacral junction, we have to understand that this is really a challenging area. And why is that mechanically? There are multiple directional forces uh, um, working on that junction, and the osteosynthesis techniques have to cover these um, multidirectional forces, and therefore special stabilization techniques and concepts have to be considered. However, coming from trauma, bone is only one side of the story. The other thing is soft tissue trauma, and I show you here a couple of pictures. You, you have on one side uh, almost intact situations in elderly gentlemen with insufficiency, instabilities, and fractures. You have severe closed um, soft tissues and also open soft tissues. And then, uh, of course, your osteosynthesis technique has to be related to that. And then we have all different types of uh, bony lesions, like an impalement injury on the left with destruction of the sacrum. In elderly people, um, a trauma fall from a ladder in the middle with um, comminution at the sacrum. Um, we have here a picture which I will, ex um, which actually doesn't show initially if you're not used to these pictures the extent of the injury. But if you look at the lateral, you see that there is a lumbopelvic fracture dislocation where the sacrum, uh, where the spine is actually broken out of the out of the pelvis, and and you see here the um, upper sacrum. You see. Uh, complete obliteration of the sacral canal or in this child a gunshot injury and I will show you how we solve these situations but these are acute traumas on the one hand we also have insufficiency fractures as you see there and pseudarthrosis situations we have pathologic situations like in this gentleman we have highly unstable situations, as you see here in this pseudarthrosis, in, um, in a paraplegic patient, actually, who came to us very late. And we see this problem uh, more and more. And then we have, of course, secondary failures of um, osteosynthesis uh, techniques in the pelvic ring. Uh, if you do not cover the multidirectional forces at the lumbopelvic junction. And I hope that I can uh, clarify some of these issues. Well, I, I spoke about um, this picture before. If you have a lumbopelvic fracture dislocation, as you can see easily, seems here on the lateral view, you, can, you have to actually suspect such an injury um, on this AP view. So you have to teach the um, residents or the doctors to actually look at the form of the sacrum here at the sacrovertebral body in the AP view. If you have already here an appearance like in the inlet view, then you definitely need your um, lateral view to really um, understand the amount of dislocation at the lumbopelvic junction. Well, understanding of these injuries um, is easier if you understand the type of fractures which you can get there. And that is a point which is, um, was long time not really um, taken very sincere. On the one hand, we have pelvic surgeons who just look at the pelvic ring and the AO classification is shown here. There are injuries which are stable, so the pelvic ring is intact. Then you have injuries where your pelvis, the second line, is unstable in the horizontal plane, but there is no shift. And then you have um, the combination, the C injuries, where you have a combined instability in the horizontal plane, but also in the vertical plane. The spine doesn't appear here in this classification. And that is the problem. Um, then, uh, in the 90s, there was this, in my eyes, um, very important paper by Isler. He was one of the first, um, this group was one of the first who realized that some of these highly unstable type C pelvic ring injuries have up to 40% an involvement of the L5 S1 facet and of that junction. So this is normally in the regular pelvic surgery, um, surgery is not covered and addressed. And that might be a reason why these patients have, in the long run, lots of problems uh, after these injuries at the lumbopelvic junction. So we actively have to look 
for um, pathologies at L5 S1 facets. So ISLA classification differs what type of injury you have at the facet joint. If your fracture line is going lateral to the facet, then your junction is intact. If it goes into the facet joint or medial to that, then you have um, the, the L5 um, S1 um, motion unit injured, and that has to be covered with your osteosynthesis. If you then fix only the sacrum in the horizontal plane, then you definitely still have your problem at the L5 S1 junction. So you have to actually look for that. Second thing is, if you have bilateral sacral fractures, you have um, to exclude any further injuries in the horizontal plane showing here. Um, very often, if you have a bilateral sacral fracture, there is a horizontal fracture line going through the sacrum, and that would result in a highly unstable situation at the lumbopelvic junction, where actually the spine is more or less broken out of the pelvic ring. And that can be combined to a stable pelvic ring or an unstable pelvic ring. So if you have um, a fracture pattern like this one, then your pelvic ring as such can be stable. But the junction between the lumbar spine and the sacrum is unstable. So you have to cover that segment. If the fracture line is going completely through the sacrum, then your pelvic ring as such is additionally unstable. And in these situations, you have to have to stabilize the pelvic ring and then connect the pelvic ring and the lumbar spine together. And this is very important to understand. So this is a classification uh, more or less describing the pattern. So this is called an H-type pattern, a U-type pattern, and then there are combinations, lambda or whatever, uh, Y-shaped fracture patterns. Um, but these uh, classifications do not um, really explain the mechanism of injury. And this is what this modified Roy Camille classification does. So <clears throat> if you have a flexion force, then you might have um, slippage of the S1, S2 um, sacral body into, uh, slipping into the spinal canal. If you have a hyperextension injury, then your upper sacral segment is actually moving and translating forward and it's very difficult to reduce. But you have to understand that if you go into surgery and if you want to reduce these fractures. And then there are two other types. One is more complete destruction, uh, yeah, destruction and impaction of the upper sacrum in a pure axial force or in direct trauma like gunshot wounds or impalement injuries, you may have a complete destruction of the sacrum. And then this, it's very hard to actually reconstruct and stabilize the, this sacrum and the pelvic ring. Well, type C pelvic ring injuries, as I mentioned before, are typically in the hand of trauma surgeons stabilized with plates, with screws, and so on. But you recognize here, this is always in just the horizontal plane. So by nature, um, this does not take over the loads which are in the vertical direction. We typically, in, after these fixation techniques, do not allow fully weight-bearing in these patients because we, we uh, are worried that we get secondary loss of reduction, and that is by purpose. The literature shows these problems, especially in elderly people, we see these situations. If we have comminution in the posterior pelvic ring, you see this here, you see breakage of plates, and this here, um, you see that actually the, the, the sacrum um, is secondary dislocating into the pelvis. That is because the vertical directed forces are not covered by this fixation, fixation techniques. And that was why in the early 90s um, in Europe, several centers came up and said, we need to, to counterbalance these vertical forces additionally to the horizontal fixation. And um, at that time, most of the injuries were in young people. We all know that the population is changing, 
and that nowadays we have more or less elderly people with these type of fractures. But at that time, in the young population, we used this technique and we allowed these patients fully weight-bearing right away. And it seemed that this fixation technique was stable enough to allow that. So this was now suddenly allowing us a much more aggressive rehabilitation in these patients. Um, however, the systems which we had for this vertical stabilization were <coughs> spinal implants, just regular pedicle screws. And um, over time, especially in elderly people, in additional crush injuries or fractures of the posterior ileum or tumors, osteomyelitis, as I have listed, we saw like a windshield wiper effect in these shorter screws. And that is actually when we came up here at Harborview, Jens, um, and, and our team, and we looked at the anatomy of the ileum, and we wanted to find out whether it's possible to put longer screws in there. Um, it's nothing new in the ileum. Uh, it's known from the Galveston technique that there are the canals where you can put in long rods into the ileum, but also there we know of the problem with the windshield wiper effect. The canal is also known from Letonel for the acetabulum fracture, so that's not new. But what turned out in our CT examinations is that the canal has two narrow areas. And if you are able to put a screw as long as possible and through these two narrow areas, then that would give you an additional stabilization of these screws comparable to the pedicle screw in the spine. It holds in the pedicle and not in the vertebral body. Um, here, it's, it's the different way. The screw gets in here. In this first part, it doesn't have a real good stability, but if the screw continues to go into more anterior parts of the ileum, then you have a high stable situation of that screw, and it doesn't matter whether you have an ileum fracture here, if you have an osteoporotic bone or whatever, because your screw is catching hold in the anterior ileum. And uh, in our measurements, CT measurements and specimens, it turned out that you needed um, a minimum of 90 centimeter, uh, 90 millimeter, nine centimeter screw. Um, and the length most, uh, the longest implants are up to 130 to 140 millimeter. <clears throat> now the question is, how do you get these screws in? Who is used to the Galveston technique or other things knows that this can be done with CM and I'll show you how you can do that. Um, now more and more people use navigation. It seems to be that navigation helps us with less, uh, in a way that we use less um, radiation. Um, however, I do not use that and most of the clinicians don't even have that. So you need to know how to actually insert these screws with the CM under a well-controlled fashion. And there are three views which are very important. First of all, a lateral view will uh, show you uh, where to put the screws. And I forgot to, show, um, to mention in the picture before that the longest canal is actually between the PSIS and the AIIS. And the question is, how do you find this canal in the regular C-arm views in the OR? Well, on the lateral view, you can make up this canal. Uh, you see here the AIIS and kind of the PSIS. Um, and if you draw a line just above the sciatic notch, greater sciatic notch, that would be your canal. In this picture, it's an AP view. I mark the, these landmarks, PSIS, AIIS, with, uh, with some metal ring. And if you go into an uh, obturator oblique outlet view, then a teardrop will appear, and that is your canal. And if you go into the obturator uh, inlet view, then you actually can see here the outer and inner table of the ileum. And with these three views, you have a pretty safe um, canal and orientation and landmarks so that you can place actually these long screws. Now, is it really that much uh, more stable than regular techniques? Up to that point, all biomechanical in, um, evaluations for uh, pelvic ring fixations, plates, one screw in the posterior pelvic versus two, and so on, did not show different significant differences 
uh, in the testing. Um, we did this free floating pelvic model testing with up to 10,000 cycles of loading with, you see, 360 newtons, so 36 kilogram in a one legs, a one stance model. And there was a highly significant difference in the stability between a regular fixation technique with an ileum, uh, with an SI screw versus the triangular fixation, which is the combination out of the lumbopelvic fixation with an SI screw. Um, all the specimens um, withstood the, this load if you do this combined fixation technique. And why is that? Well, if you look at the picture here, your center of rotation is roughly here in this area or here in the middle. And the lumbopelvic fixation at first is transferring and bridging the loads from the trunk through the implant around the fracture site into the ileum and the pelvic ring. And with that, transferring all the loads outside of the fracture area and the fracture zone is, um, is protected by this fixation. Second reason why this is better than regular fixation is that it withstands, um, and you can understand that by looking at this picture, the flexion deformity forces. For that, it's necessary to have a very long lever here in the ileum. And then, so, um, and then in the, the fixation technique also allows you to stabilize in the horizontal plane, either if you combine this lumbopelvic fixation with a horizontal screw, an SI screw, or if you do it bilaterally with um, a cross connector. And with that, you have a multi directional stabilization for this multi-directional instability. How do I do now the actual fixation and the OR? In the OR, if I have an unstable pelvic ring, I always fix first the anterior pelvis because if you turn the patient and if you deal first with the posterior pelvis, then your anterior pelvic ring may displace in any direction because you cannot control it. So you fix first the anterior pelvis, turn the patient, and then you can manipulate, and I will show that to you on the model, much easier the posterior pelvic ring and can do my reduction. Um, here are some pictures, intraoperative pictures. I put then, after fixation of the anterior pelvic ring, the L5 pedicle screw in. Here you can nicely see the canal with the teardrop figure. This is the long ileum screw here, and I leave the connectors on the screws. So I have two handles with which I actually can do the reduction at my lumbopelvic junction. If I have a fracture dislocation um, between the lumbar spine and the pelvis, I can on both sides really lever the complete spine and pelvis against each other, and I can do it on one side as well. Well, then you put on the um, longitudinal rods, and along the longitudinal rods, you can, with a distractor also, reduce in the vertical direction, whatever you want to do. And then I stabilize it with the um, iliosacral screw in the horizontal plane. Um, one of the problems which occurs in unilateral fixations is that if you distract to reduce your fracture, that at the um, L5 is one spine, um, spinal motion segment, you will have a widening, a unilateral widening of that facet joint and the disc space. That may cause you some scoliosis. Therefore, it's important that you release this distraction force after you have fixed the SI screw and the sacrum with the horizontal screw. Now, what are the indications for this technique? First of all, you have to consider the soft tissues and decide whether you can actually do an open approach. But if you have neurologic compromise, then there is, of course, one time point where you have to address that. So in highly unstable unilateral sacral fractures with involvement of the L5 and S1 facet, as well as in bilateral lumbopelvic fracture dislocation, we see the indication for these uh, lumbopelvic fixations in comminutions or in associated posterior ileum fractures. Now, this is this 10-year-old child 
I want to show you that this fixation technique is also possible in children. This is one of Jens' patients. Um, so you see that here, uh, despite the thin bone, it's possible to actually get these long screws in, out, in, in the ileum, and that allows you a good fixation and stability, and you see the two and a half year follow-up um, with complete fusion of the posterior pelvis. This is a 19-year-old male, and you see here the, the uh, pelvic ring as such is intact, and the sacrum is completely broken out of the pelvic ring. Um, this is the typical bilateral injury where the pelvic ring is intact and you have a pure lumbopelvic dissociation. Since the canal is compromised and obliterated, you need to do a laminectomy, sacral laminectomy. You need to free the, sac the, the sacral nerve root canals, so you need to do a foraminotomy, and that causes you even more instability. And that is the indication for this combined lumbo, uh, triangular fixation with lumbopelvic fixation and horizontal stabilization. And that is the situation in that uh, shown picture before with the impalement. And you see in the lateral CT reconstruction how destroyed the sacrum is here. So also in this situation, you can do that posterior tension band fixation with the lumbopelvic fixation. And you see here in this that there is a um, breakage of the longitudinal rod. That is not necessarily a sign for a pseudarthrosis. But this fixation technique bridges the intact SI joints. And if the SI joints are mobile and not fused, formally fused, then any fixation technique and stable fixation will break at some point. So it's, it's uh, an acceptable picture of this breaks. However, some people are worried and also, so that is one reason and second reason that these screws may be prominent in the back and therefore we take these implants out after 9 to 12 months. Um, that is a patient with a Y variant uh, sacral fracture and I apologize, I don't have the CT here, but that was um, stabilized with these as eye screws and it looks pretty good in this situation but the forces are tremendous at that junction and that was the case where these screws gave and where you had secondary dislocation very early on in that fixation where you then go into a lumbopelvic fixation. Well we analyzed retrospectively 19 of such patients who also had neurologic compromise. So these were the severe lumbopelvic fracture dislocations. All of these patients had no loss of reduction, um, but there were some complications uh, with soft tissue problems, um, seroma, and local infection, but related also to morel lavalle lesions. And you have to uh, remember that we, these were very severe soft tissue injuries. Um, I mentioned to you that we started full weight bearing in these patients, which is for some people very hard to believe. But that is a patient, patient with a plasmocytoma and more or less complete destruction of the sacrum with additional fractures in the adjacent ileum, as you can see here. So in this patient, we did um, the splinting, more or less, of this ileum fracture with two... Um, Ilium, long ileum screws here, and then bridged that whole unstable sacrum with this lumbopelvic fixation. And on this picture, you see that patient during his first week postoperatively. So we mobilize these patients as tolerated with full weight bearing, despite this highly unstable lumbopelvic junction. So the, the stabilization and implantation um, is strong enough to allow you full weight bearing. That is his one-year follow-up uh, under hemato-oncologic therapy. Insufficiency fractures is um, in our hands, at least nowadays, uh, what we have to deal with the most. If we have these fractures non-displaced, we very aggressively and early on start fixation techniques, typically percutaneously. However, and these can be done with crossing screws here in the States. You have the very long screws which go all the way through. We did, do not, unfortunately, get these in Europe. Uh, you can combine these screws with cement 
uh, you should definitely not use sacroplastic alone because this is not taking care of your multi-direction instabilities. If you have a displaced fracture, you then have to go into lumbar pelvic fixation. And in these elderly people, we see at least lots of soft tissue problems postoperatively. In order to avoid these soft tissue problems, it is very important that your screws here at the PSIS are recessed because otherwise they are under the skin. If the patients are not mobilized very early on, then they may be prominent and they may get pressure sores and other problems. We use it also in spondylodiscitis at the lumbopelvic junction with the fixation, long fixation to have good anchorage here. Um, that is the example of the pseudarthrosis at L5 S1. And you see that you can do long bridging of these defects. This was also connected and related to a chronic infection. And now it's losing me, the last example. Um, all right, so, so you can use, and that is the end of it, um, you can use this fixation technique for a variety of instabilities at the lumbopelvic junction, but you have to remember that you need to bridge the vertical and the horizontal direction. Thank you. Fantastic. Why don't you show us how to do this in the lab? Jens, can you see the um, acetabulum? I can kind of see it yes. here. Yes, we can. Okay, good. So the, these are my landmarks, and what I typically take from that time um, point is um, a drill. I take a 3.2 drill. Um, unfortunately, we do not have that, so I take an awl, well, the thinner one, and I just follow that track from the entrance point. Show me that. And I just follow. Show me that. Above the sciatic notch, and I try to aim at the um, superior part, supraacetabular area. Show me that. And that would be the direction of my screw at, in the lateral view. If I'm not sure whether I'm now in the right direction and in the right canal, then I take the uh, previously mentioned obturator oblique view, obturator outlet view, so please come up and roll here in this direction. Okay, stop. And now tilt that way. Go further down, please. Down. Open that. Not quite like this. And this, and now go further towards the feet. Okay. Show me that. All right. Open that, please. Click. No, click. And there you can appreciate the teardrop. So I know I'm in the right direction. But I. Well, Thomas, what are the anatomic boundaries of the teardrop? What is the cortical landmark made up of? The cortical landmarks are the outer table of the ilium on the outside. Let me show that to you. This is click here. No, click. Here, this is the outer border of the ilium, then the inner border of the ilium, and then down there is this, um, the um, caudal border of the um, sciatic notch. So, and that creates your teardrop. Thank you. Yeah, and that is where you follow um, the canal and you open it up. And then show maybe the third view, just turn like this. No, leave this, yeah. Show me that. Yeah, and go further towards the head, good. And there you see the all, 
in the ileum and you see the outer border and the inner border of the canal as well. And with these three views, you have a pretty good idea um, whether your screw will be in the right position. So you do not necessarily need navigation for that. Um, when I have opened the canal in that way, and as I said before, I would use a 3.2 drill bit, then I go again into the lateral view. Can, can I have the screw there? You do usually. Yeah. How many projection angles do you take? Do you do like three, four, five shots? Yes. You also have a kind of feeling, um, especially in osteoporotic bone, um, where, where your drill bit will go. Because the trabecular bone is very thin in these situations. Go a little bit further towards the feet and uh, higher up. And the cortex is something where your drill is bouncing off. So you do not need that many views in these situations. Show me that, please. Yeah. Go a little bit further, like this, click. Can you enlighten this picture? No, that's not good. I'm sorry for the picture. But this goes just above the uh, acetabulum anteriorly. Go further down again. Good, click. Ah, yeah, okay. And as when this is open, then I take out my drill, and then typically I take um, 110 to 130 screw. In osteoporotic uh, situations, I take, an, and in, in female bone, I typically take um, an 8 millimeter screw, and in the situations otherwise, a 7 millimeter screw. Um, and then I just follow and and rotate and, and uh, forward the screw. Show me that. There's a lot. I once had a very osteoporotic lady where I put in these screws pretty rapidly and she became rapidly decompensated and we suspect that she had fat embolism. Do you suction out the uh, drill tracks or irrigate them out or anything like that? No, I don't. You're not worried about the bone debris that goes in the bloodstream? No. Okay. Show me that. This looks close to the acetabulum. Is this the opposite side? Show, I think it's the opposite side. Show me that again. How can we know? We can rotate. Show me that. OK. OK. A couple of degrees. Now, it's very important that you recess that screw at the PSIS. And I hope you can see it here. Maybe you can uh, increase the size here of the specimen, pic picture of the specimen. Can we zoom in on the clinical picture, the overhead camera? The camera for the clinical picture? That's OK. Why don't you keep going? OK. Now, so I have recessed the screw here. And now I have the two uh, screw positions here. Um, and now it's important that you do your reduction. You can do the reduction actually over these screws. If your hardware system allows you to still have the connectors on the screws, on both screws, then you actually have a lever. Can I have a second um, bar here? Then you actually are able to manipulate your reduction with these levers. And, and that is very helpful, especially if you have a lumbopelvic dissociation, because the forces which are, um, have to be counterforced and, and um, are very tr uh, high. And it's very hard to reduce an impacted sacrum, as I have shown in some of the pictures. Um, when the screws are in, that is the time point when I only do my sacral laminectomy, so that the time, if there is bleeding or anything, is kept very short, and that I have the positioning of the screws already done. Is that what do you do, Jens, as well? Yeah, very similar. 
Okay. And I do fuse more often. I take the upper iliac crest and fold it down into the lateral uh, lumbosacral junction. So. Yeah. Great. Hey, Thomas, so in the interest of time, can you conclude now? Okay. Um, I put in the longitudinal rod. Can you come closer with the clinical picture? I put in the longitudinal rod, that's good. And what is important is you then stabilize the longitudinal rod on one of the screws and the other one I leave open. I take um, a distractor at that time point and I do a more detailed vertical reduction with the um, distractor. And when I have done that, and if I'm happy then in the inlet and outlet view of the sacrum, I put in the horizontal SI screw. And then it's very important that you release your distractive force at the lumbopelvic junction again. And that has, the, uh, you should not underestimate, otherwise you may have a deformity in unilateral lumbopelvic fixation with a scoliosis at the lumbopelvic junction. So is it necessary in a trauma patient to always put the SI joint screws in, or is it okay to just put the lumbopelvic screws in? Well, in, some, in lots of situations, you cannot put an SI screw in um, because you have a destruction of SI or um, of the sacrum, the upper sacrum. In these situations, you need a cross-connection between the two sides, between the two lumbopelvic fixations. If you have a unilateral lumbopelvic fixation, you definitely need a horizontal fixation with an SI screw. If in these situations it's not possible, you need a second anchorage screw on the contralateral side in the ileum. Outstanding. Thank you very much, Thomas. Mm -hmm.